Welcome to the beautiful Virgin Islands, also known as the Gem of the Caribbean. Come and enjoy our crystal clear waters, white sand beaches, and our lush green mountaintops. We are located between the Atlantic and Caribbean Sea. Whether through the local and commercial fishing industry or through tourism, it is indisputable that we depend heavily on coastal processes here in the Virgin Islands. Marine waters serve as a hub for resources and ecosystem diversity for coastal communities. The Rich to Reef concept is one that is endorsed by the IUCN, which promotes healthy and well-managed river and coastal margins, especially being that they support livelihood through fisheries and tourism. Pollution of our marine ecosystems is an impending problem in many island communities like the Virgin Islands. However, in order to protect and properly manage coastal processes, one must first identify any factors that may be damaging to the system. This is why we endeavor to first identify point source and non-point source pollution variables in the Virgin Islands. But before we do that, let's put things into perspective. The U.S. Virgin Islands is comprised of four larger islands and some 50 small islets and caves, which is approximately 133 square miles in total. Tampa Bay, which is 2,201 square miles, is 16 times the, ta the size of the Virgin Islands. Many of the same issues that threaten coastal waters in the mainland are present here. However, due to our size, their effects are more concentrated. The island of St. Thomas has a population of approximately 51,634 locals. The local wastewater system is comprised of a series of lines, manholes, and pump stations that transport sewage from approximately 60% of the population to various treatment plants on the island. The remaining 40% of the population depends on septic systems and drain fields. However, due to the island's soil composition being mostly caliche and our shallow topsoil, these factors make septic systems difficult to maintain. A normal functioning septic system should allow for water to travel through the septic tank and into the drain field where it travels through the soil and is purified via natural processes. However, when soils are predominantly caliche, this effluent settles and eventually pools at the soil surface where bacteria can accumulate. The territory's wastewater treatment system consists of eight treatment plants which provide secondary treatment or are in the process of being upgraded to do so. In addition, there are 31 pump stations as well. Even though there are a total of 22 wastewater collection sites on the island of St. Thomas, similar problems exist for the other percentage of individuals utilizing the centralized wastewater treatment. Frequent treatment plant equipment breakdown Collection system failures and heavy rainfall events lead to the discharge of untreated sewage into marine waters. Residents utilizing septic systems and drain fields are urged to pump their septic tanks regularly, about every three to five years is recommended, to prevent the flow of solid waste from entering the drain field. This and the disposal of materials that should not enter the septic systems are the result of improper education on proper septic system maintenance. Referring back to the island's landscape morphology, much of the terrain is comprised of hillside slopes. The Virgin Islands government mandates that if you are not within 50 feet of a public sewer line, you are required to utilize a septic system and a drain field, and this applies to many residents who reside on these hillside slopes. When their septic systems fail, liquid, solid, and bacterial waste matter accumulates on these hillside slopes and with the natural force of gravity, travel downhill and into nearby watersheds. This becomes compounded during heavy rainfall events which can occur during hurricane season, which is usually between May and November, when it can occur outside of this time frame. These heavy rains accelerate the movement of this material into nearby watersheds and into coastal waters. Immediately following heavy rainfall events, Locals and tourists alike are urged not to swim in beaches because this septic material contains a combination of nutrients, bacteria, and pharmaceutical waste which can result in infections, gastrointestinal ailments, to even add on the most extended end of the spectrum, death. For the past 30 years, 
Thermal desalination, which depends on the use of fuel oil, is the method in which the Water and Power Authority of the Virgin Islands, also known as WAPA, has been using to provide portable water for the community. However, with the grand opening of a new reverse osmosis plan, which was designed by the Seven Seas Water on November 21, 2013, it has ensured safe drinking water for the community. It produces up to 1.5 million gallons a day. It works by pushing seawater through various filters at high pressure, separating water molecules from everything else. It is filtered through multimedia filters that contain materials such as sand, garnet, gravel, and pebbles. Further filtration occurs through the reverse osmosis membranes that are enclosed in fiberglass tubing. The desalinated water is then stored and treated with calcium carbonate and chlorine for disinfection and taste. The brine water, which is a byproduct of desalination, is led back into the sea through an outfall. The location of the outfall should not be located near a sensitive marine ecosystem. Unfortunately, the area of this outfall is located in Lindbergh Bay, which does have sensitive marine ecosystem. Rum Factory produces Crucian Rum, which is one of the most prized exports for the people of the Virgin Islands. However, the affluent from its production washes up into our coastal waters, making certain bays no longer safe for bathing and fishing. Tourism is a large part of the economy in the USVI, accounting for about 30% of the GDP and employing approximately one third of the people in the USVI. This industry is very dependent upon coastal marine ecosystems like coral reefs and beaches but is also detrimental to them. Cruise ships require places to dock and to accommodate them, channels often need to be dredged, which destroys the seagrass and corals living there, as well as increasing the turbidity and harming surrounding reefs and meadows. Also, cruise ships can increase the chance of invasive species entering the area through ballast water. Hotels often impact coastal habitats because they are built right along the shore and their construction can involve the removal of coastal habitat like mangroves or salt ponds. They also harm the coastal waters through the use of fertilizer. Lush gardens and landscaping surrounding luxurious hotels come at a price. The excess fertilizer is washed into waterways and oceans, aided by hotel sprinkler systems. These excess nutrients can cause algae blooms and upset the balance of ecosystems that should naturally be very low in nutrients. Additionally, hotels often comb or clean beaches, removing rack and other organisms from the sand, thus stripping the beach ecosystem of nutrients on which animals and plants rely. Hotels also nutrify beaches by adding sand to prevent the beaches from eroding, but the heavy machinery used crushes or buries many beach species and packs on the sand, making it difficult for turtles to dig their nests. Nutrification can also alter the color of the beach depending on where the new sand came from, which can change the temperature of the sand and the gender ratio of species such as turtles, which rely on egg temperature to determine gender. The sheer number of tourists increases the amount of litter on the island and the amount of trash and waste produced, which can tax existing infrastructure. Swimmers also introduce sunblock into the water which can cause coral bleaching. Even something as seemingly innocent as children collecting seashells can change the beach habitat, alter calcium carbonate recycling, and increase beach erosion. Some of these negative impacts can be reduced if tourists demand environmentally friendly vacations in areas that are protected. Also managing where tourists go can help minimize their impact and educating tourists about options like reef safe sunblock can help reduce their impact. Additionally, seasonal beach closures can allow areas to recover or sea turtles to lay their eggs without interference. St. Thomas chooses to dispose of its population's waste through the use of the Bavoni Landfill, which also absorbs trash generated by the neighboring island of St. John. The landfill is 330 acres large, with 40 acres directly bordering St. Thomas's largest remaining mangrove lagoon. The extensive mangrove lagoon, along with an interwoven network of seagrass beds and nearshore coral reefs, have been deemed critically important enough to warrant protection in our very own marine reserve and sanctuary known as the St. Thomas East End Reserves, which we refer to as STEER. The boundaries of STEER encompass roughly 9.5 square kilometers with 34 kilometers of coastline. The red mang mangroves within the lagoon are essential nursery habitat for juvenile fish and invaluable for the mitigation of coastal erosion and hurricane buffering. Extensive root systems of the mangroves also trap, stabilize, and filter terrestrial waste which would otherwise make its way into the coastal environment. 
With over half of St. Thomas's historical mangrove habitat having been cut down and replaced by coastal developments, these ecosystem services have been lost in many areas. The seagrass beds of steer play a significant role in the life cycle of nearshore organisms ranging from sea urchins to queen conch to sea turtles. Similar to the mangroves, they are also responsible for a certain amount of sediment retention and stabilization. Not surprisingly, the shallow water coral reefs play a crucial role in providing food and habitat for a plethora of nearshore organisms as well. The boundaries of these habitats in the reserve are often blended together and overlapping with one another. The impacts of the coastal Bavoni landfill adjacent to these nearshore ecosystems is one concern which our island continues to face. A recent NOAA report has shown that PCBs, DDT, copper, lead, and mercury levels in the steer sediment samples are all above NOAA's sediment quality guidelines. While the landfill may not be solely responsible for this, presumably its proximity to the coast and sheer volume of human and industrial related wastes are contributors. The interactions of these chemical inputs on the nearshore ecosystems are not explicitly understood, though each one is known to have negative environmental and health effects individually. Sediment and nutrients are the most influential forms of land-based sources of pollution contained in runoff. They are especially important to manage in oligotrophic marine environments like the Virgin Islands, which have historically been characterized by clear water and low nutrient concentrations. The addition of excess sediment and nutrients has detrimental impacts to the nearshore marine environment and coral reef ecosystems. Nutrient enrichment in an oligotrophic system can cause eutrophication and increased algae abundance in the water column. Sediment loading to nearshore environments increases suspended particles and turbidity in the water column. Both increased algae abundance and turbidity prevent sufficient light levels from reaching the benthic environment in which coral reefs are found. This causes bleaching and mortality of corals whose endosymbionts rely on light to provide energy to corals. Nutrient enrichment from runoff can cause an increase in the prevalence of coral diseases. In some cases, nutrients may even increase the virulence of various causative agents of coral disease. Land-based sediment also has the potential to act as a vector for terrestrial microbes that can cause disease in corals and other reef organisms. High sediment loads can exceed a coral's ability to clear deposited sediment from its surface causing smothering, burial, and diversion of energy away from other essential life processes such as reproduction. Corals buried by sediment can bleach and reef mortality can increase. Nutrient enrichment of the nearshore marine environment can also increase benthic macroalgae abundance which compete with corals for available space or overgrow them completely. So, runoff in the Virgin Islands is an issue as it is everywhere. The Virgin Islands is a little different than other places in the globe. For one reason, uh, the Virgin Islands tend to be very steep but small islands. So, we don't have a tremendous amount of runoff. So, the, the actual amount in terms of rivers, we don't really have permanent rivers for the most part. So, most of the runoff comes in pulses that are driven by rain events. And when creeks, or what we locally call guts, are filled, <coughs> those flush out. So most of the impacts on organisms are very acute. Um, they also tend to be very localized near shore because of the fact that they are small systems, so the input relative to the marine environment around it is, is relatively small. So they tend to be localized near those outflows, and they tend to dissipate within a week or so after the storm or whatever acute event caused the impact. Um, but definitely includes sediment, because we have very loose terrestrial soils which are easily washed off. We also have poor uh, building practices, or at least uh, permitting practices, which allow for the creation of excessive runoff, which is quickly flushed into the marine environment. Um, we also have some industrial activities in the maritime environment, such as boat building, where runoff is not well, uh, well encapsulated and kept out of the marine environment. And then we have um, dumping facilities that aren't well controlled. Um, and then you add on top of that septic systems which is the majority of the, the systems used for treating waste for individual home septic systems. Um, they're not very well regulated. There's not good enforcement in terms of maintaining those systems. So many of them are failing or leaking uh, directly. And then because we have a very permeable environment, that tends to run off very quickly. Specifically in the Caribbean, hundreds of years of overfishing have severely degraded coral and seagrass health by the removal of large grazing predators from the ecosystem. 
These grazers historically kept macroalgae abundance low and facilitated coral larval settlement, which kept the system in a coral dominated state. The removal of these large grazers through overfishing, along with the massive diadema mortality event in the Caribbean, coupled with increased levels of sedimentation, nutrient concentration, septic pollution, and other human induced coastal impacts have been considered responsible for the shift in this system from a coral dominated state to a macroalgae state. Macroalgae dominated systems do not provide the sturdy three dimensional structure that corals do. Therefore, reefs dominated by macroalgae tend to erode due to the lack of calcium carbonate production, which is provided by scleractinian corals. Since these three dimensional structures provide habitats and nutrients for an array of economically important fish and invertebrate species, the degradation of these structures can limit the amount of commercial fish and invertebrate species available thereby impacting that coastal economy. In order to restore these coral dominated systems, we need to understand the ecology prior to any human induced disturbance or baseline information. Many studies have assumed that this baseline information can be attained by studying coral reef systems prior to European invasion, but very few studies have looked at Indian impacts to these systems. A four-year study conducted by Rogers and Miller on St. John in 2006 indicated that historical overfishing stressors, stressors such as the decline of herbivorous species, particularly sturgeon and parrotfish, and their lack of recovery may be preventing the retransition from a macroalgae back to a coral-dominated state. Archaeological digs in St. John have indicated that pre-Columbian fishing decreased abundances and sizes of predatory snapper and groupers by native Taino people a thousand years ago, half a century before European discovery and conquest. Therefore, this initial reduction in native predators may have, initi may have initiated the phase shift which has now taken place in the Virgin Islands. By re-establishing these predators, we may be able to restore these systems back to a dominated state. The key to coral reef resilience is the ability for the ecosystem to recover after disturbance and to prevent a phase shift from coral to macroalgal reefs to occur. Many coral reefs worldwide have already undergone these phase shifts because of overfishing, declining water quality and climate change. By removing macroalgae, herbivores play an important role in resilience. Two groups of animals can be critical as herbivores of large fleshy algae, fish and sea urchins. Herbivorous fishes are diverse and are made up of several groups that perform different ecological functions and have different roles in preventing phase shifts. Some fish just browse or graze on algae, cropping it like grass or leaves and picking the soft parts to eat. Some actually scrape the rock the algae is attached to, excavating part of the rock and turning it into sand. Scraping of the surface of the reef prepares new surfaces for colonization by corals. The number and type of herbivores play a critical role in the competition for space between corals and macroalgae. In general, the higher the herbivory, the lower the macroalgal cover and the healthier the coral. The loss of herbivores can trigger phase shifts. In Jamaica, overfishing followed by a disease that killed most sea urchins led to a dramatic shift to an algal-dominated reef. Herbivores can also help reverse a phase shift and return a reef from algae to corals. An experiment on the Great Barrier Reef surprisingly showed that batfish, previously thought to feed on invertebrates, became responsible for eating algae and reversing a phase shift. The IUCN Climate Change and Coral Reefs Group has adopted a methodology for measuring herbivores on coral reefs. It is crucial for populations of herbivorous fish to be monitored and protected if we want coral reefs to survive climate change. <laughs>